everybody, it's Chris Kresser. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. Today I'm really excited to welcome Justin Sonnenberg as my guest. He is currently Associate Professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Stanford School of Medicine. He conducted his PhD in Biomedical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego in the laboratory of Ajit Varki. His postdoctoral work was conducted at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in the laboratory of Jeffrey Gordon. After moving to Stanford University in 2008, Justin received an NIH Director's New Innovator Award. In 2011, he received the Burroughs Welcome Fund Investigators in Pathogenesis of Infectious Disease Award. He and his wife and collaborator, Erica Sonnenberg, PhD, are the authors of the book, The Good Gut, Taking Control of Your Weight, Your Mood, and Your Long-Term Health. The goals of the Sonnenberg Lab are to elucidate the basic mechanisms that underlie dynamics within the gut microbiota, and two, devise and implement strategies to prevent and treat disease in humans via the gut microbiota. The long-term objective of the research program is to continue to the emerging vision of how our microbiota may be incorporated into precision medicine. I met Justin at, a, at the UCSF Paleo event a couple months ago and was really impressed with the presentation and talk he gave. I've read his book, which I enjoyed, and I've been familiar with his work for some time. So I wanted to invite him onto the show to discuss the, the latest research on the microbiota and its connection to health and disease and you know, harvest some clinical pearls for what we can do to improve our microbiota and our overall health. So without further ado, let's dive in. This episode of Revolution Health Radio is brought to you by 144.me. 14.4 is a diet and lifestyle reset program I created to help you dial in the four pillars of health, nutrition, physical activity, sleep, and stress management. Whether you want to lose weight, boost your energy, treat a chronic health problem, or just maintain your current good health and extend your lifespan, these are the four areas you need to focus on before anything else. In the 14.4 program, I walk you through every step of the process, from cleaning out your pantry and shopping for the right foods, to recipe and meal plans, to video demos of workouts that you can do at home without any special equipment, to guided meditation and stress management programs, to daily sleep tips, to personalized recommendations for what to do after you finish the reset. 14.4 is a great option whether you're just getting started with this stuff or you've been on the path for a while. In fact, I do a 14-4 myself three or four times a year to hit the reset button and give myself a boost. To learn more about how 14-4 can help you achieve your health goals, head over to 14-4.me. Okay, now back to the show. Justin, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be with you. So... Uh, you know, when I first met you, it was at the UCSF symposium where you did a talk on some of your uh, research on the microbiome. And before we dive into some of the specifics there, I think it would be interesting just to kind of get a state of the union, uh, uh, the latest microbiome research from a general perspective. My listeners are very familiar with the microbiome. I've been talking about it for years. But there was an interesting paper, I think it was published in Nature, correct me if I'm wrong, that contradicted this long-held idea that we there's a 10 to 1 ratio of, of microbial cells to human cells in the body, which I think I put in my book a few years ago. It was kind of the you know, dominant idea at that point. And this, this recent paper suggested that that ratio is maybe more like 1 to 1 or 1. 1.3 to 1. So I guess my question is like, does that matter? You know, that's interesting. Does it matter? Does it change any in the way that we're looking at this at all? Or uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So, right. That was a, a nice paper just to kind of start a discussion about this. And it actually was published in Cell. But, um, right. and, and they, they, you know, revisited some of the um, traditional literature on which early estimates were based. And I think a lot of the um, recent numbers that have been cited came from. And then they, they have gone back through the literature, uh, more recent literature, and, and detailed a more thorough accounting of, of cells on both the host and microbial sides to come to this number of, of 1.3 to 1. And I think it, it highlights a few things. The first thing is, you know, counting is difficult in science and it's a little bit maybe counterintuitive, but particularly when you're dealing with, you know, m these microbes that are so incredibly small, 
in places that are hard to see with incredible dynamics over time and probably tremendous variability from individual to individual in terms of densities um, across populations. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to distill this down into just one number. I think the original number of 10 to one, you know, that we're more bacterial or more microbial than we are human was just a back of the envelope calculation. It never really was meant to be something as real quantitative, but it gave us just kind of this new kind of um, perspective that we do harbor a lot of a lot of microbial cells, and so the more recent number of one point three to one, there there are a few things to note there. So there were revisions on both sides. The microbes got a little less abundant, and human cells got a little more abundant. But in this revision, they, they you know counted our red blood cells, which by far are the most numerous type of cell in our body, making up over 80% of the cells in the human body. Now, these cells aren't even really considered as cells by a lot of biologists just because they don't have a, a nucleus and they, they don't conduct a lot of the same biology and signaling that normal other cells, nucleated cells do. So if you get rid of those cells, we're back to a 10 to one ratio. Okay. And, um, and the, you know, the, I think you know, it's important It's in, important to come to more accurate numbers over time in science. I think it's important to pay attention to this kind of developing line of inquiry, but it doesn't change the fact that we have this tremendous number of microbes that inhabit the human body and they have a really tremendous impact on our biology, which is probably the most important part. Even if it was only five cells and they have the impact that they do, we would still want to study the heck out of them and understand them really well. And that's really the important part. Right. Can't get too hung up on these particular numbers, uh, although they are as fascinating as they are. And did that revision in the estimate of cells, the ratio of, of cells affect the uh, estimates in uh, in terms of gene, the genomes? So there's the hundred times, you know, the, uh, the estimate I've seen a lot is that we there's a uh, hundred times more gene, genes in the microbiome than there are in the human genome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that number is interesting and it really depends on the way that you look, look at that number. So a lot of people throw that number out there. And, and I, I think a major question is, does that refer to the collective microbiome across the whole planet um, in terms of the number of microbial genes that right. could be in the gut or is it for a single person? So that's right. really important. Mm -hmm. And if you're considering all the microbial genes that are out there as one of the factors in this, in this ratio, um, that's going to grow with time because as we survey more and more microbiomes across the planet, we'll discover more and more genes. And even if we're, we were just studying a single microbiome, the estimate would go up over time just because sequencing technology gets better and our computational algorithms for detecting these genes gets better. So that number will continue to increase over time as we're able to delineate more and more gene families. This probably had a slight downward effect on that just because of the downward revision on on microbes, but on the one hand, cell number is not equivalent to the species makeup of the gut microbiota. So you could have, you know, a species there at 10 times the abundance in one person than another, and it doesn't change the collective genome that's there because that mic has the same genome. So it's probably not that big of an effect. Right. So there, there's a quote that I came across a, a while back that I, I think was attributed to you, and I'm going to just paraphrase it, but it's something along the lines of humans are basically uh, elaborate vessels for the propagation of, of microorganisms. Yeah, that's that's good. And actually, I, I stole that from somebody named Dwayne Savage, who's a one of a previous generation of scientists that really established the foundation for this field. But I think it really puts into context that, you know, it the microbes are, are holding the reins to a lot of what's going on and they're if we were not doing a good job at passaging them around to additional culturing flasks, uh, specifically other humans, um, they would undoubtedly discover ways to make us better at doing that. And so that's, you know, I, you know, I think a more optimistic or, or different way to frame this is just that we're composite organisms, that we, I think, traditionally think of ourselves, the human body, as a collection of human cells. And what we really are is an ecosystem. We have microbial and human parts 
that come together to work in a concerted fashion to make us this super organism. And we can't forget about the microbes because they're really an important part of our biology. Yes. And that's, I mean, we're right now we're just laying the groundwork and that's exactly what I wanted to do to start. And I think it's really important to have that context because for so you know, for up until very recently, all of the discussion around what di- what kind of diet is appropriate and, you know, other kinds of environmental and lifestyle interventions have all centered around their effect on the human host and not necessarily on their effect on microbes. And as you talk about in your book, which we're going to uh, come back to later, and also in the presentation that I watched you give, you know, one of the things I've been arguing is for every bite of food that we put in our mouth, we should think about how it, or, or anything that we put in our mouth, not just food. You know, we talk about antibiotics and, and other things that influence the microbiome, but we should consider how it affects us, you know, the human host and also the microbiome. Yeah, that's very well stated. I think that, you know, if you look everything from dietary guidelines to just kind of common sense advice and, and what we try to think about in terms of nutrition for for people that, that concentrate on this, I think that microbes just haven't been a part of the conversation um, up until very recently. And it, it, that really needs to change because I think that it's, you know, our appreciation of this microbial community has come to the point where we understand that, you know, what, exactly what you said, what we put in our mouth is what is driving what this community is doing and therefore influencing health and disease. And so that's something that we just need to think about and, 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 you know, try to make a bigger part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're, you're at a cocktail party and you meet someone and they have absolutely no idea, you know, maybe they've been living in a cave and they haven't heard the word microbiome. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's really in the popular media now, but let's say they've never heard of the microbiome and they've never really thought about this stuff at all. How would you explain to them in a sort of cocktail party way, (laughs) what the functions of the microbiota are, you know, what, what's the main role that it plays or the main roles that it plays? Yeah. So, you know, this community and just to get, make sure that the lingo is straight, because I, you know, I have different words that'll wind in as I'm talking and I want people to understand. So, you know, I think traditionally scientists in this field talked about the community of microbes as the microbiota and then their collective genome is the microbiome, but they're, has been an evolution in the terminology to where a a lot of people, particularly non-scientists, refer to this community as the microbiome. And part of that was fueled by NIH, National Institutes of Health, using that term in their human microbiome project, this five-year project to perform a lot of sequencing and and kind of lay a foundation for this field. So I I kind of use the two interchangeably now, but I might use microbiota, um, which just means the community. So you know, I, I think um, for people that, that haven't up to this point been, been paying a lot of attention to these microbes, it's important that, to note that probably the, the major function of this community that we've known for decades and which has held up over time, even in the face of all this technological innovation in, in studying this community, is that the microbes in our gut mainly live in the colon, in the distal part of the digestive tract, and therefore really only have access to items that we eat that are poorly digested by our own digestive enzymes and are poorly absorbed in our small intestine. And so this is primarily dietary fiber, the complex carbohydrates that are found in plant material. Um, This is what escapes our own digestion and the upper portions of our digestive tract makes their way to the colon and, and then are you know, consumed and serve as, as the primary fuel for driving the metabolism of the microbiota. So digestion of these complex dietary fibers is um, probably one of the major functions that have that is um, attributed to and, and been proven to be um, really important for this community. But, you know, an extension of that is the importance of these microbes in gut health. We know that these microbes can make us feel good or bad in terms of digestive health. Bloating can be an issue. We know that inflammatory bowel disease can be driven by these microbes. And so there's always been an appreciation that the mic- the microbes in our gut play a role in gut health. I think what has really been startling to many of us in in this field, and certainly people outside the field, is just how much of our biology outside of the gut is being controlled by these microbes. We know that 
metabolism that's going on all over our body, for instance, in our liver, is directly affected by what's going on in our gut microbiota. We know that our brain can be affected by chemical signals that these microbes secrete into the bloodstream or get absorbed into our bloodstream and then circulate through our body. Um, so that, you know, it's really the gut microbiota, I think, can be thought of as a control center for so much of our biology. And by far, I would say to this point, the most important facet of our biology that's impacted by this microbial community is our immune function. And again, certainly in the intestine, but throughout our body. So how likely we, we are to fight off a respiratory infection, how quickly an autoimmune disease in our central nervous system uh, progresses, uh, how we respond to vaccination, all of these things are impacted by what our gut microbes are doing. And so that means that because the gut microbiota is malleable, because it changes day to day and we can affect it through what we eat, that means we have an incredible lever on you know, many aspects of our biology, including how our immune system functions. Mm -hmm. I just want to excerpt something you said because it's it struck me when you were doing this presentation. It was on one of your slides and you just mentioned it now which is this idea of the microbiota as a control center for human biology. And I think if you were to give just, you know, a one sentence explanation that would really encapsulate what we're talking about here, because it's, it's not just impacting digestion and absorption, as you said, which we've known about for a long time, but it's, uh, it's having these systemic impacts on the immune system, the metabolism, also brain chemistry, we know the microbiota has a pretty profound effect on uh, mood and behavioral dysfunction. And what this means as, you know, if, if you're just a, a regular person or if you're a clinician is, you know, if a patient comes in to see me and they have a tendency to get a lot of colds and flus and they have maybe some mood disorder or, you know, anxiety uh, and maybe they're overweight and insulin resistant, First thing I'm going to be thinking of is the gut, whereas maybe that might not make a lot of sense to someone in the general public. It's really when you embrace this concept as, of the microbiota as a control center, you start to see the potential for how we can intervene with these chronic diseases. Yeah, I, I think that's that's excellent. And, you know, you mentioned chronic diseases, and I think that this is, you know, that there's a, a major connection between what's going on in, in our gut microbiota and inflammation, which occurs at various sites through our body. And we know that it's inflammation that drives many of these chronic diseases. And so that's probably a really fundamental, important connection. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, another thing that, that struck me from your talk was just this concept of the microbiota as a mediator or a mechanism that is behind you know, much of the modern disease epidemic. And that, that doesn't mean it's the sole, it's the, even the root cause. You know, the causes might be more proximal things like our diet and, you know, not sleeping enough and excess use of antibiotics and an over-sanitary environment and all these things. But, but the way, the mechanism by which those causes leads to disease may be the microbiota in many cases. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderfully stated, Chris. I think um, we don't want to overhype the microbiota as being the you know root cause of every you know right. malady that we're experiencing. Right. But I think uh, I think of you know reframing it as a, a moderator of many of these effects is incredibly important. Probably a good example of that is obesity. There's been a, just a tremendous body of literature generated over the past decade connecting gut microbes to. Um, obesity and metabolic diseases. Uh, very clear that you can take the microbiota from an obese mouse and put it into a healthy lean mouse. And that lean mouse that receives just that microbiota eating the same exact thing that it was eating before will start increasing weight more rapidly, gaining weight, and um, start exhibiting some of the um, metabolic derangements from the donor or donor animal. And you know that's that the, these were are really profound findings in the field. They they are very solid, have held up in a variety of labs in a variety of instances. But I think that going back to the you know your point about the root cause, I don't think anybody would argue that in the vast majority of cases. It's what people are choosing to eat that's driving obesity, but then clearly there's 
this really important part that the microbiota is playing in, in the propagation of this um, of, of these diseases. And so, so that's that's one example. These you know Western diseases or um, non-communicable chronic diseases in general are interesting because that you know. We call them Western diseases because we see them in, in industrialized countries. We see that the vast majority the majority of these are the trends are going up in synchrony. That they're they're just rising in in prevalence, and there are dozens of them. You know, and, and it ranges from heart disease to autoimmune diseases like allergies, asthma, multiple sclerosis, um, many cancers. You know, the, the metabolic diseases as we were just talking about, and um, you know, one possibility is that there's dozens of, of different things that are, you know, contributing to all of these diseases. But I think a, a much more likely explanation is there's a, a handful, maybe just a few major issues with how we're living our, our Western life that is really driving a lot of, a lot of this disease. And I, I think that there's a lot of arrows pointing to how diet has impacted the microbiota and, and potentially other factors in Western life like antibiotics and, and sanitation and so forth, many of which have had really great benefits to society, but at the same time have had collateral damage to the gut microbiota very likely, which um, may be playing a, an incredible role in, in many of these Western diseases. So, And we can talk more about the studies of traditional populations microbiota if you want to, but there's very good evidence now that the Western microbiota the microbiota of Americans in general is very different than it was very recently in evolutionary history and that, that we've actually lost species, lost diversity, and that our microbiota is somewhat deteriorated. Right. It's, I mean, this is such a rich topic of conversation. There's so many ways we can go. I, I do want to just point out something that you said that I think is so important for people to get. And I have, have long, you know, just as a health educator and a clinician, I'm interested in finding, you know, simple ways to talk about things that aren't oversimplified and overly reductionistic. And one of the kind of formulas that I talk about is this, you know, if we think of what is the, the, the root cause of most modern disease, it, we could say it's a combination of genetic predisposition plus modern environment. And then maybe the, the media, one of the primary mediators of that, that determines how, the, what disease we get, you know, because not everyone gets the same disease. Someone, one person gets type 2 diabetes, another person gets eczema, another person gets autoimmune disease. And that's, you know, maybe what determines that is genetics and epigenetics and, and the microbiota and, and the genome, or the microbiome. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think a really important part of this is there's a, um, a really nice developing body of literature that shows that the gut microbiota, actually, if it's fed dietary fiber, something that's greatly deficient in the Western diet, and then ferments that fiber and creates chemicals known as short-chain fatty acids. That's the fermentation end products of what the microbiota is doing to fiber. Um, those get absorbed into our circulation and, and have uh, apparent anti-inflammatory effects, mm -hmm. which means that if we're not eating fiber, our microbiota is not producing as many short-chain fatty acids, and we don't have the same level of anti-inflammatory compounds floating around in our bloodstream. And one of the really common denominators of these chronic Western diseases is inflammation, that it's really, you know, decades of inflammation that sets us up to get one of these diseases. And then it's inflammation that drives it. You know, you can think about something like arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, perhaps, you know, there are many diseases like this that are just driven by inflammation. And I think the idea of epigenetics and human genetics, our own genetic uniqueness as a person, probably is what is determining whether we get heart disease, mm -hmm. allergies, or you know, eczema, or or something else, um, multiple sclerosis, for instance. I think that these are all normal human genetic variation overlaid on this inflammatory state that is being created by multiple factors, but probably diet by microbiota interaction is a major contributor. Yes. And this is the reason I think this is so important is, be, is because, you know, that's not really what's been communicated over the past few, few decades and, and conventional medicine 
there's a you know a doctor for for each different body part and so if you have heart disease and you have eczema you know you go see the cardiologist for heart disease you see the dermatologist for eczema maybe you see an immunologist if you have an autoimmune disease and all these things are being looked at as separate conditions and as a patient it can be pretty bewildering to just have this idea that you've got all of these kind of separate but and disconnected things happening and not to have an idea that there might be a common root cause that's driving all of these pathologies and that and of course what that means is if if there is a common root cause then there's a possibility of intervening at that level and seeing an improvement across the board in all of these conditions instead of trying to address each of them in a in a kind of silo fashion you know with specific drugs and things uh, for each condition. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point and one of the scary directions and, you know, ultimately it may be useful in some instances, but is to watch as this field of research focused around the microbiota um, goes further down the track of traditional drug discovery, trying to find yeah. small molecules that can target the microbiota and try to knock out some problematic function. And when you're dealing with a complex microbial ecosystem, it's just so incredibly difficult to find something that'll be both generalizable across many people, or at least a, a across a big enough bin of people, category of people that it's worthwhile to develop, and then also will give you the desired or predicted outcome. And you know, I think that this idea that there's probably some very simple answers to this really complex system that we maybe can get you know eighty percent of the way there by just applying general rules, and then focus on the remaining 20% that will be individualized and recalcitrant to these um, very generalized methods forward. I think that that would be a really productive way to look at this. And actually, we've recently started Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford. I'm co-director with somebody named David Relman, a pioneer of this field. And I think one of our big hopes with that center is to focus human studies in a direction that will allow us to gain insight into how we can modify um, lifestyle practices, diet, uh, medical practices in a way that you know protects and restores this microbial community to try to get us up to that 80 or so percent of just general rule reaping the benefit from that and then turn our attention to these more specialized things that will require personalized approaches. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's get back to a little bit more specifics on the microbiota. You know, we've, we've so far in this interview and also just in general, there's been a lot of discussion on the importance of a healthy microbiota. But do we know what that is yet? You've already hinted that it may not be the same for, you know, you and I as it is for someone, a Hadza hunter-gatherer, for example. It's a, it is a very important question. And it's actually, you know, it's, um, one of the major goals of the Human Microbiome Project um, that started in 2008 and the um, method, which was very reasonable at the time, was just to survey in depth the microbiome of, you know, over 200 individuals and to try, uh, healthy individuals and to try to distill out common features. And what became apparent over the course of studying this American population, healthy population, and then, you know, other studies that started looking at traditional populations is that, you know, the, the microbiota that's in a healthy American may not necessarily be a healthy microbiota. It may actually be a problematic microbiota that's predisposing us to many of these, these diseases that will, you know, take decades to develop, but which are a, a partially a product of, of our microbiota. And so as the field is, has progressed and more and more of these populations that don't live in industrialized areas that live um, either hunter-gatherer lifestyles or rural agrarian lifestyles, what's become apparent is these traditional populations have much more microbial diversity. There's so many more types of bacteria in their gut microbiota. And then many of the types that they have are completely missing in the American population. And so it really suggests that we've um, somehow gone through a bottleneck through, you know, some aspect of our, our Western life or multiple aspects of our, our uh, modern life. And it really has left us with this major question of, well, 
Is it that inferred ancestral microbiota that would actually be healthier? Or maybe that would be more problematic now because of epigenetic changes and, and um, other environmental and, and dietary changes that just aren't compatible with this community. <clears throat> so I, your question is a, is a really profound one. And I don't think we have a, a great answer to it yet. I would say that the one thing that appears to be holding up and getting stronger, there's more and more evidence lending to it, is that Americans have a low diversity microbiota. But even if you look across the American population or European population, you see there's a spectrum of microbiota diversity. And the people with the lower diversity have you know, worse metabolic health, higher markers of inflammation. If you put them on a dietary intervention that increases their microbiota diversity, a lot of those markers get better. So this still isn't causal evidence, um, but it, it lends to this idea that, you know, we don't want infinite diversity in our gut microbiota. There's probably an optimal amount of diversity, but most of us in the industrialized world are probably operating below what an optimal amount of diversity is for the gut microbiota. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the research connecting changes to the microbiota and disease, is a, a reduced diversity a, a major factor that you see across the board in studies looking at different disease states? Um, you know, by and large, that's the case for the gut um, microbiota, I would say. There have been a lot of studies that have taken, you know, a healthy cohort and a, you know, disease X, Y, or Z cohort and just looked at the species that are present in the gut microbiota. And typically, if there's a change in diversity associated with disease, it's usually downward. Um, so, you know, a lot of obesity studies that have been done, there's much reduced diversity. A lot of times when there's an inflammatory condition, there's reduced diversity, you know, but there are exceptions to this. There's, if we shift over and think about the um, community that the microbiota that resides in the vagina, um, bacterial vaginosis, a disease in another microbial ecosystem on the human body, that is typically associated with too much diversity. And that's typically a low diversity ecosystem. So it really depends on the specifics but I would say by and large for the gut, what we've seen is that reduced diversity typically partitions with a, a disease state. So what are some of the main causes of re reduced diversity in the, you know, to, I would imagine lack of fermentable fiber is the main one, uh, but you've mentioned a few others in your presentation. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're the, the things that we can observe in experiments. So if you give antibiotics to a person, you can see that their microbiota diversity um, is greatly reduced and then gradually rebuilds over the following weeks and months as the community recovers. There are other factors in the modern modernized world that are likely contributing to re reduced diversity across the population. So, you know, cesarean sections are actually um, known to greatly influence the microbial community that first colonizes the um, infant gut to the point where it looks more like a skin community from a C-section baby than a vaginal or, or stool microbiota from a um, baby that's born through the birth canal. And we don't know the ultimate effect on adult diversity, but this is um, something that could affect the succession and, and building of a, a new microbiota as a baby is, is growing and developing. But other things that we know that human milk has important uh, molecules in it that help fuel the microbiota, these molecules called human milk oligosaccharides put there, it appears for the express purpose of feeding and assembling microbial community, attracting uh, species like bifidobacteria and bacteroides species. So this might be a factor of the fact that that formula, a lot of formula is used that doesn't possess these compounds. And then just overall sanitation. I think we just don't share a lot of microbes. Again, you know, all, all of these things have had great benefit mm -hmm. to other aspects of, of our society. And so it's a matter of figuring out the right balance, making sure that, for instance, C-sections are only used when they're needed. And then perhaps if they are needed, there can be some medical practice that can compensate. There was recently a paper published actually taking a swab of vaginal secretion from the mother and applying it to the skin of the um, newly born baby, the baby that was born by C-section to influence skin community. So we just have to think in terms of ways that we can, you know, have the best of both worlds with this knowledge in hand. Mm -hmm. 
I just saw another paper published suggesting that lactobacillus ruteri rot- may be effective in helping to repopulate the gut after a C-section. Although to me, the vaginal swab makes a lot more sense in terms of getting the, uh, you know, a broader spectrum of microorganisms there that are particular to that, the mother. Yeah, right. And, you know, I think this sing- single species idea is, you know, there's obviously... Um, data out there to show that single species can have profound effects on ecosystems. And certainly that's most apparent in the case of something like Salmonella or Shigella or Clostridium difficile pathogens that where a single species can go in and completely remodel the entire community and, and host situation. But certainly, you know, you can think about analogous situations for beneficial health. But I, I think you're right that, you know, the ultimately what we're looking at is a complex consortium. And so it's very likely that it'll be mixtures of microbes that are the solution to a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. So speaking of solutions, to to what extent can we manipulate the microbiota? You know, what what does the data show on that now? I mean, how, how much control do we have over our microbiota and what are the most important factors that that are driving that? Yeah, so it's a great question. We, you know, there's Again, an emerging picture that the microbes that we're colonized with early in life can be with us for a long time, that they get privileged access to sites in our intestine that may allow them to exclude other species that are, you know, to the party um, second and third. And so probably early life colonization events are incredibly important in dictating long, long-term trajectories and makeup of this community. Although we know also that the microbiota can be changed really profoundly in a matter of a day or two with a big change in diet or with a course of antibiotics, if we kind of take the flip side of that. And so there are ways to greatly impact this ecosystem on very short time scales. And it suggests that as we gain more knowledge and better understanding of the ground rules of this ecosystem, that we may be able to nudge it one direction or another. I think you know, the the prospect of instead of thinking about drugging the microbiome, thinking about reprogramming it, um, thinking about how we may actually use entire consortia of microbes to remodel how this community is structured and the functions that it carries out. I think, you know, the, the fact that a major part of our biology is connected to this microbial community, and yet the com- microbial community is malleable, is just really profound. I think it's changing you know, the paradigm of biomedicine, of thinking about how we will exact change on human biology, that it used to be there was great emphasis on the possibility of gene therapy, that we could go in and manipulate our genome. And certainly the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 revolution has uh, reawakened that that sort of conversation. But I think that this idea that we have this major microbial component that we can change and shape over time is really profound. And it's just a matter of figuring out the right ways to kind of nudge it into the uh, more healthy directions. And I just want to point out for listeners, when we talk about changes over time, these some of these changes can happen pretty quickly, right, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that, uh, you know, there's a, a beautiful study um, that, that showed that, you know, after just uh, 24 hours, if you switch somebody from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet or vice versa, you get this really profound change in, in the microbial community composition. And, and so... Certainly, you know, what you're eating is going to greatly change what this community is doing. And and then there's other studies that have shown that long-term dietary trends are really important, that over the course of years, if you eat a certain way, you can kind of shape the microbial community to be built around that sort of diet. I think the fecal microbiota transplants to cure Clostridium difficile are another situation of where on a very short time scale with, in this case, therapeutic intervention of live microbes derived from a healthy person's microbiota, you can just completely remodel a diseased microbiota, reboot it and make it healthy again. Right. And after the FMT, the, the recipient's microbiota basically assumes a similar profile to the donors. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And you know, over time again, that microbiota is shaped by some of the residents that were there that have hung on. There's mm-hmm. it's shaped by the dietary trends of the recipient, but ultimately it's been well established that these microbes that make their way into the community during the, the transplant um, set up shop and, and basically set up a, a new microbial ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So, Justin, you've written a, a book about this topic, the good gut, taking control of your weight, your mood, and your long-term health. I've read it. I really enjoyed it. It's one of the reasons I was looking forward to meeting you at the UCSF event. I, th- I think you did a fantastic job explaining some, you know, potentially pretty complex topics in a way that most people can understand. And also in just imparting the importance of you know, tending to your microbiota, if, if you know, in, in order to protect your long-term health and prevent chronic disease. So t- tell us a little bit more about, you know, what led you to write this book and, and uh, you know, what your goal is with it. Yeah, sure. So, you know, in my background as a basic scientist, I, you know, studied very specific molecules that are not of general interest to the general public for much of my um, PhD and postdoc. And, and as I became more involved in studying mechanisms underlying gut microbiota structure and function, I started to notice that I was changing my lifestyle and diet. And my wife, Erica Sonnenberg, is We've been working together for many years and and run this lab together at Stanford. And, you know, we have two daughters and we noticed that we were raising our daughters differently over time as we learned more about this field and did more research. And so that that involved diet, that involved lifestyle. We were eating a lot more fiber. We got a dog. We started gardening, really paid less attention to washing our hands um, Mm -hmm. just to make sure that we were um, introducing environmental microbes into our life as long as we hadn't been at a a place where we thought there was a potential for acquiring um, some scary disease. We eat a lot of fermented foods now. And we, we noticed that as we were doing this, we noticed that a lot of our friends, scientists and non scientists alike, were not doing a lot of the same things we were doing. And then we go to a microbiota conference where it was all microbiota researchers. And many of these researchers would be doing the same exact things that we'd be doing. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, this is really problematic that we have access to information that is really convinced us to change how we live our lives, but that the information really isn't available or at least isn't being well conveyed to the the general public out there. And so we wanted to... um, to capture that in a book, to just kind of write about the field broadly, to inform people, it's going to be incredibly important in in medicine and health going forward. So for, there was that reason, and then also just to convey our story, how how this science has impacted us and our lifestyle and, and diet choices, so that people can assess the data and then make decisions for themselves. And it was actually through a connection with. Andy Weil, I spoke at his conference a few years ago. He heard the story that I was just, you know, talking about in front of this group of um, physicians and healthcare practitioners, and he said, you know, you gotta, you gotta write a book, and I'll, I'll help you make that happen. And so that was kind of what, what um, was the catalyst for, for us doing this. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much, Justin, for taking the time. I know my listeners are really going to appreciate this, and uh, if you're looking for a really in-depth but accessible explanation of the microbiota and its importance in health. I can't recommend Justin's book highly enough. It's sitting here on my shelf. It's it's a reference that I turn to occasionally. And uh, Justin's a, a fantastic uh, speaker and has a, a way of communicating these things um, that, that's just really easy to, to understand. So check it out. And uh, Justin, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks for the great discussion, Chris. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.